Welcome to the Big Fellas Podcast, where we chop it up about all things past, present, and future about the game of basketball. Where facts, stats, and context reign supreme. That is blasphemous. Sometimes it gets crazy, but we always keep it real. Always keep it real. Get ready to learn from players, coaches, and fans from all levels of the game and see the court in a brand new way. And now, fresh off the sidelines, here's your host, John Hartofillis. What it do, fellas, and welcome to the Big Fellas Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, J.H., coming to you from New York City, the mecca of basketball. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Drew Hanlon, the gold standard of basketball skills training. I spoke with Drew about how he used his relentless work ethic to build pure sweat basketball, what it's like training some of the NBA's best in Bradley Beal, Joel Embiid, and Jason Tatum, and why you have to stay humble when you have everything you need. We've got a go in store for you today, fellas, with our season finale, episode 50, Drew Hanlon, NBA skills coach. Hey, Coach Drew, what's going on? How's it going? I'm glad we got to finally do this. It's an honor to have you on, and I'm really excited about all these questions I have to ask you. Really quickly, can you get us started with talking about the work ethic that made you such a great high school and college player, working up at 4.59 every morning to really be the best version of yourself? What did that look like for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, to be honest with you, the word that comes to mind is sacrifices. You know, I knew that uh, I wasn't an elite athlete. I knew that I, you know, wasn't blessed with just raw talent. But what I was blessed with was a relentless work ethic to improve and to maximize every ounce of potential that I had in me. And so, you know, that started really when I was really young, you know, falling in love with the game, which I always say is the first step of, of being great at anything. And I started just to crave improvement. You know, I wanted to uh, see how far I could take the game of basketball. And so when I was 12 years old is when it really started. I gave up sweets, no Snickers, no ice cream, no candy, no soda. Uh, I actually didn't have any of those things until I was done playing college basketball at 22. So I can honestly say I didn't have any sweets as a teenager. But for 10 years, I did that. And then, um, you know, like you said, one of the big things that was a a very notable thing during the recruiting process was I used to shoot a thousand shots every morning before school. If I didn't make 800 out of a thousand, then I would redo it again at night. And I did that every morning. I woke up at 4.59 a.m. And, and really, it was just my ways to separate myself from everybody else that was just as good or close to being as good as me. You know, it led me playing two NCAA tournaments. Uh, we won a state championship in high school. So I was very fortunate that uh, my playing career was better than probably expected from the 5'11 average athlete that, that I was uh, kind of born into. Awesome to think about in terms of how that work ethic made you really play above what most people would have expected you to play. It was interesting to me was that waking up at 459, you can't really be staying up late. And when those West Coast games are going until one o'clock in the morning, you have to sacrifice staying up to watch those. What was that process like for you learning how to watch basketball to learn instead of watching for enjoyment? What did that look like? To be honest with you, I know I'm going to age myself. I mean, I'm only 31, but there was no such thing as YouTube when I was growing up. So what I used to do is I used to use a VHS tape uh, and I would record Michael Jordan play. I'd record Kobe Bryant play. And then whatever they did that night, the next morning, I'd be in the driveway, you know, working on it. And that's what really led me to, to kind of what I do now. You know, I really fell in love with the side of studying the game and trying to take what you see and apply it to your game through hard work and through strategic work. And I did that to myself, my own game first. And once I was able to kind of prove myself, then I started to help improve others. And, you know, now that's, that's what I do for a living. It's great how you've been able to use that to help improve others. I remember hearing you on another podcast talking about the first time you actually were offered to train someone and what that was like. So a parent seeing you going really hard in a workout and saying, hey, can you kind of get my son to do that? It was that kind of moment that made you really flip the switch and say, I could do this for a living and professionally. What, what, what kind of got you doing that? To be honest with you, I was uh, I was in high school and I was one of the best players in the state of Missouri, and I was driving around a car that didn't start, you know, on half the days. If it was too cold out or if it rained the night before, the car would not start. And so, I was looking for ways to make money. And so, I went up to a gym and I asked him if I could be a referee because I heard referees made eighteen bucks an hour. Well, he said, "Hey, you have to have credentials. You have to go through like refereeing school." I hadn't done any of that stuff. I was sixteen years old at the time, and um, He said, but listen, why do you want to be a referee so bad? I said, 18 bucks an hour. He said, you know what? I'll give you 18 bucks to coach my kids. Now, when I started coaching their kids, I didn't want to go through and teach them a bunch of plays. And I didn't want to teach them, 
you know, just basic kind of um, team philosophy stuff. I was like, let's just get really good at playing the game of basketball. I'm going to teach you guys how to make decisions. I'm going to teach you how to finish through contact. I'm going to teach you how to shoot. I'm going to teach you how to do all these things. And so I started to coach in the player development aspect, but then I had a parent come up to me one day. I was working out at the facility that I was, you know, uh, coaching a team at. I was working really hard. Parent came up to me. George Baker was the parent of the player. And he said, hey, my son Matt's over there. He's never worked like you just worked. You know, he's like, I watched you for your entire workout. I want to pay you 20 bucks to put my son through that exact same workout. And there I was like, man, I got a $2 pay raise, you know, from coaching to training. But really, I fell in love with it from the first work I'd ever had because it allowed me to do two things that I love. I love helping people and I love basketball. And that's what basketball training is all about. You get to help people through the game of basketball and and hopefully you help them on and off the court, which is something that I pride myself in. That's so great. And then from the business side, what started the transition to Pure Sweat? And when did you think of the idea, the name, when did that all kind of fall into place for you? To be honest with you, I had to start Pure Sweat because I was a recruitable athlete and you weren't allowed to use your name and, and image to promote any products or services. So I had to come up with a name, which actually was great for me to actually start you know, branding. And my high school coach and I both came up with Pure Sweat just because we were kind of trying to embody everything that we loved. We were like, we love the purity of the game when it's at its truest form. You know, just like the love of the game, we think that's lost in so many cases and so many people forget why they started playing. So that's where pure from pure sweat comes from, the purity of the game, the pure love of the game. And then sweat, we think the only way to maximize your potential is put in a ton of countless hours. I always think of the image of a champion, someone bent over, dripping in sweat at the point of exhaustion when no one else is watching. That's where sweat comes from. We, we hammered those together and said, hey, if you keep the pure love of the game alive and you work your butt off, which is going to result in a ton of, you know, sweat, then you're going to get results. And so that's where pure sweat came from. And that's what it stands for. No, it's grown so much since you first started it. It's crazy to see looking back how far pure sweat's gone. I recently, this past December, went to the TPG Scout School event, the physical one in Brooklyn. And it was it was great. And just about a month after I had gone, I saw the transition when you guys had partnered with them and, and taken over. What is that kind of expansion into, into those new ways of, of training, not just basketball players, but scouts, coaches? What does that look like for you and how you're looking to do that? I mean, for me, it's all about helping as many people as I can through the game of basketball. And so we started out by me training players. And then the second phase for me was to start helping coaches. And that's why I started doing, you know, coaching drill books and coaching seminars. The third step was start helping trainers grow their businesses so that they could make, you know, their hobby of training into a full-time job and then turn the trainers that were doing it full-time into kind of super trainers where they can really kind of grow their businesses and, and grow their brands and, you know, be able to help better service their athletes. And the next component for us was scouting. You know, we loved everything that pro scout school, you know, had to offer. And we just wanted to bring it under the umbrella because we really want to be able to cater to everybody that wants to use a game of basketball to improve their life. And, you know, that's one aspect that we didn't have at the time. We needed to be able to help people that wanted to be scouts and wanted to be in the front office and improve as well. And so uh, we, when we had a chance, we, we end up uh, acquiring it and we're looking forward to doing a ton of new things uh, to just continue the uh, great brand that Pro Scout School already is. In just such a short time, you've already done so much and grown it in so many different ways. I can't wait to see what the next year or two, maybe even think, it's kind of crazy to think about five years holds. What, one of the things that I thought was really cool is how you've always been very close with other trainers in the space, like Alan Stein and, and, and kind of working with EGT a little bit. What does that look like for you in terms of Pure Sweat's your thing, but then also helping out other trainers and, and their other brands? You know, to be honest with you, when I first started training, I looked at everybody as competition. And the truth is, there's so many players that want to improve that there's no chance that I'm ever going to be able to personally help every player. Once I had that understanding, I said, you know what, the best way to grow the game of basketball is to try to help all the people, coaches and trainers that are impacting those kids' lives. All I want to do is even the playing field. I want every kid that has a, a passion for the game of basketball and, uh, you know, and craves improvement to have a fighting chance to reach whatever dream that they set when they're playing the game. And so I think there's a lot of players out there that love the game, that work hard on the wrong stuff or have the wrong guidance or don't have somebody in their corner that can elevate them to the level that they want to. And eventually 
they fall short of reaching their dream, whether that's, you know, being a starter on the varsity team or whether that's playing college basketball or playing pro basketball. And so that's what I don't want. I don't want kids that put in a ton of hard work to work on the wrong things and to end up kind of costing themselves uh, a future, you know, and a lot of times that leads to depression. A lot of times that leads to, you know, self-confidence issues, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what my real goal is, is to help the people that are helping the players so that we can eventually just grow the game of basketball in the right direction. Thinking about how you've been helping all these people, Sean Belby is another person that's come on the show and he's a really good friend. I mean, you're so used to training players to be better, but he's another person that's similar to yourself as a super young trainer. I'm sure there must be other trainers at that age. What's it like seeing all of them kind of follow in your footsteps in that same way? I love it. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, I just built a, a trainer school, a virtual trainer school, which is my business basketball training course. I have a next mentorship program, which is me getting on FaceTimes with all these up and coming trainers and helping them grow their brands and their businesses. And then I have internships, you know, and, and Sean's been a part of all those things where you just, I can really be hands-on and really help, uh, you know, not only give them a blueprint, uh, but also help provide solutions for problems that I know that are going to come up. Um, you know, I've just been in the game for what I think 13, 14 years now. And so um I've went through the struggles of not being able to find gym time. I went through the struggles of dealing with agents for the first time when you start working with high level players. I've been through the struggles of, you know, being able to, uh, you know, expand where you're going from one gym to now multiple gyms around a, a certain area for me it was St. Louis when I was growing my, my brand. So just being able to kind of help the trainers get to where they want to faster and to, to build a more uh, build a more strong foundation so that they can eventually have the platform they really want to have in, in the long run so that they can impact the game with the way they want to impact the game. Just to kind of get an idea for, for our listeners as to how hard you work and, and how much basketball kind of dominates what you do. What does a typical day look like for you in terms of how many practices you're doing, where you're going gym to gym to train different high level players? What does that look like? It really depends on the time of year. You know, during the off season, I'm normally in the gym 12 hours a day. You know, that could range from 6 a.m. start time, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., depending on who, who all is out there until maybe 4 p.m., take a little break to eat lunch. Yeah, 4 p.m. is probably my first meal. And then get back in the gym at maybe 5.36 to do night shooting. During the season, it's a little bit different. I'm just traveling all around the country. And just basically, I'm only with one client. So then I'm only in the gym for two hours a day, but I'm doing film for, you know, the rest of the day. And then also doing some bi business endeavors that, you know, that I like like doing, just providing content for coaches, doing the FaceTimes for the mentorship program, et cetera. So it really depends on the type of time of year, just because um, they're so different in season and off season. In that time of players working on their game, how, how do you see the balance of them balancing their time between skill work and strength and conditioning work? Or what do you kind of think you see works with most players? Yeah, most guys are, are typically doing anywhere between six to 10 workouts on the court each week, you know, and that consists of five skill workouts, three kind of shooting workouts and two competitive workouts where they're doing decision-making drills, one-on-one, -on -one, three on three, five on five, et cetera. And then lifting You'll see guys that'll lift three to four times a week usually. And then on top of that, they're doing rehab or prehab to prevent injuries. Uh, they're doing their soft tissue, deep tissue work. They're doing their recovery stuff. I mean, it's a full-time job, but I would say they're normally getting six to 10 basketball workouts a week. And they're usually getting three to four lifts a week. Just depends on what the guy needs. If the guy needs to change his body, he's going to you know, be in the weight room more. If the guy needs to change a shot, he's going to be in the gym more. It just kind of depends on you know, what they need. And then we put together a strategic program to make sure we're maximizing, you know, their time that they're, they're out there with us. And, and you've definitely put some really high level players through these strategic programs. Uh, one guy that you've had since the start in, in Jason Tatum has grown so much in his short time in the league. What, what did you kind of see when you first started working with him? I mean, I, I, I'll tell you this. I mean, I told the Celtics, I'm, I'm really close with some of their front office people. I remember telling them as like Jason, when he was 15 years old, I said, hey, this kid is going to be the pick in the draft. And while I was wrong, the number one pick was the best player in that draft. And so he just had a tremendous work ethic. He really loved the game, he craved improvement. He was coachable. You know, I, I think a lot of these top guys that are high school players that are be touted, they're not coachable and they're not patient. And Jason was both. You know, he really uh, wanted to improve. He let me 
you know, break down his game and make him feel vulnerable at times, but he knew that it was going to benefit him in the long run. And he was patient enough not to rush kind of the process. You know, he really just understood that if he was able to go from, you know, here to here and here and just keep growing kind of one thing at a time, then eventually he was going to be the player he wanted to become. And so he's still on that journey. He still has things that he's working on each and every summer. We're trying to improve at least one skill, but he's definitely headed in the right direction. And, and he's somebody that I know is just going to keep getting better year after year, just because of the way he works. Definitely. And another guy that's just consistently be getting better is, is Bradley Gill, who, who you've obviously known since you were playing against him in high school and dropping 50 on him. I, I should add a little bit, um, which was something a lot of people wouldn't really know about, but um, recently, obviously, the Wizards just pulled off trading John Wall for Russell Westbrook. How do you see that playing out in the next few weeks when the season kicks up? What, what do you see kind of with Bradley Beal's game that you think will translate well with Westbrook's? Yeah, I mean, first off, I mean, Brad was the second leading scorer in the NBA last year at 30.5 points per game. So we know how good he is. Everybody in the league respects him. I know that the uh, the writers disrespect him and, and some of the, uh, the snub voting of all-star, all-NBA teams. But the truth is, you know, Brad's a guy, he was one of my first clients. He was really a big reason why I'm at where I'm at today. You know, his success, a lot of people gave me some credit for it. And me being a part of his journey allowed me to really, uh, you know, accelerate my journey as well. But with, with Russell Westbrook, I mean, you're acquiring a guy that, I don't know, I think he's been an eight-time All-Star, maybe nine-time All-Star. And a guy that's been... Uh, an MVP in the league and a guy that was an all NBA player last year. So I think the expectations from Wizards fans will be, we've got playoffs now. You know what I mean? As long as everybody can stay healthy, especially those two guys, we're, we're going to be a playoff team and in a very competitive Eastern conference. I think, I think it'll be uh, very similar to John. I mean, they play very similar, you know what I mean? Russell Westbrook, I think is going to help the Wizards on the boards, which they really struggled rebounding the ball. And, I hope that they can develop the chemistry that allows them both to shine and, and excel in, in what they do best. Of course, Bradley Beal's a great player. When I had Tommy Shepard on just a few weeks ago, he was raving about how he's got so much room to grow and he, has, he probably hasn't reached his peak yet. There's so much more left to go and it's going to be amazing to see what, what ends up happening with him. In that same breath, though, of, of guys getting overlooked, uh, you tweeted a few days ago about when the NBA 100 to 50 rankings came out from SI, how they ranked Zach Levine at 56th. What, what was your initial reaction to that? Where do you think he should be? First off, I just thought it was a joke. I thought it was a joke because they ranked a, a bunch of people over him that are not even not even close to being the player that Zach is. But I just think he gets constantly disrespected. I know that people will always say, "Oh, well, he hasn't he hasn't won anything yet," or you know, "Oh man, his defensive rating was really low." But the the truth is, these are individual awards: All Star, individual award, All NBA, individual award, rankings, individual award. So I just think they should stop punishing players for being on bad teams when the truth is they are some of the best players in the world and so there are not 50 players in the NBA that are better than him you know his NBA brotherhood would tell you the same thing I always say that if you wanted to do a real ranking what you do is you'd start it out at the top maybe you say hey listen LeBron you're a team captain you're the best player in the NBA you're a team captain number two whoever you want to say number two but if KD's healthy KD number two you guys are captains pick they're going to go through, here's the third best player, here's the fourth best player. They're going to pick these guys. Zach Levine would not be there with the 54th pick or whatever, 55th pick or whatever number he was. And so that just shows you that people that actually play the game of basketball respect him a lot more than the people that do the rankings. And, and there's so many different situations where, that, where that's the case. We haven't really touched on the mental side of the game. And as a trainer, that's another big part of what you do in terms of being able to relate to your players and, and, and coach them through some difficult times, whether it's being snubbed, losing a really tough playoff game. And um, I know that you're really close to Joel Embiid. When the Sixers lost to the budget last year, the Raptors on the miraculous shot to the Kawhi hitting game seven, it was obviously really hard for him. What was your role like as a trainer and kind of coaching him through that and making sure that he's able to come in the next day and keep on trying to get better? Yeah, I mean, my, my job, I always tell people, is, is not only to get them really good on the court, but also to be really happy off the court. I don't think that players can be bad off the court and then good on the court. Now, I know that some people will say, you know, hey, life was rough off the court and, and I use basketball as my escape. But the truth is, once you get to the NBA level, life as far as, you know, off the court, is usually what causes the struggles on the court because all these guys are really good at basketball. You know what I mean? So if you see somebody going through a shooting slump, it could be mechanical, but most of the time it's mental. Most of the time they're overthinking their shot, they're overcorrecting their shot, or they're overstressing about something else that's going on. And that's what's causing the hiccups that you see, you know, in the mechanics. So I think, I mean, like the Joel situation, you know, what you do is you 
and it happened. How, what can we learn from it? How can we grow from it? What can we improve moving forward so that hopefully it doesn't happen again? And then let's attack it. But uh, you can't dwell on the past. You can't live on the past. And you got to make sure that you're rock solid off the court and don't let anything off the court trickle into court struggles as well. Who are some guys that maybe outside of the guys we just mentioned who are superstars to all stars that you've worked with that you really think are going to shock the NBA world um, in the next few weeks when the season starts? I mean, to be honest with you, I keep telling people that the guys that I think are going to take huge leaps that uh, we haven't talked about, I think R.J. Barrett is going to take a huge leap, you know, readjusted a ton of mechanics on his jump shot, and he's getting good results with those. And then Kelly Oubre. You know, Kelly Oubre has grown and improved every single year. Him being in the Warrior system, I think will take some time to adjust. But once he adjusts, I think his energy, his effort, his tenacity on defense, and his talents on offense – I think are going to really shine. It's going to be the first time I think he gets a little bit respect because people know how good he is based on kind of what he's done the last couple of years, but they still don't know how, how much he can impact winning. And so I think that this year it will give him a chance to kind of show how good he can be on a winning team. Well, I, I definitely can't wait to see both those things happen, especially as a, as a native New Yorker. I'm really hoping you're right about RJ Barrett. I mean, I'm <laughs> really, really hoping that you're right about that. Uh, and, I, and I believe it'll happen. And then obviously we've touched on so many different experiences. You, you've seen so much. And it's crazy to think that you're only 31 and you still have uh, so much more basketball left to be played, so much more lives to touch and so many more players to develop and train. What's some advice you would have given to yourself when you first started training that you didn't really know at the time that would have really made you a better trainer in the short term back then? I always said a couple things. I think one, from a training perspective, I would have just said, hey, listen, you don't know shit. Uh, you know, when I, I, when I first started out, I remember going to watch some NBA trainers at the time and I watched their workouts and I said, man, I can do that. I'm ready for that. Like, why are NBA guys not giving me a chance? And remember, I'm, this is like when I'm 17, 18 years old. I'm like, I can do exactly what they're doing. I can even do a better job. And while maybe I could have done a better job, in my opinion, than those guys that I was watching, the truth was, I wasn't one one hundredth of the trainer I am now back then. And so just having the humility to continue to study the game, continue to ask questions, continue to improve my craft. Those are the things that I think have, have made me, you know, get to this point where I'm at and allowed me to, to have some success. And so first thing that I would say is, hey, you don't know shit, you know, be, be hungrier than you are for knowledge, be thirstier for good knowledge. And, um, you know, if you do those things and you're going to get to where you need to get to, to really help these guys out faster, that's the first thing. The second thing that, that I would tell myself is honestly something that my grandma used to tell me growing up. And I wish I would have taken it truer to the heart. She always used to say, Hey, listen, Drew, you're never going to have everything that you want, but you're always going to have more than you need. And when I look back, I remember when I was younger, you, you, I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted credit. I wanted followers. I wanted fame. I wanted, you know, all these things. And those things don't matter at all. You know, at the end of the day, all that matters is the, the lives that you impact and, you know, the, the people that you end up helping on your way. And so I would have told myself, hey, really, you know, hold, hold that quote that, you know, my grandma Mimi used to always tell me, you're never going to have everything you want. So don't trip if you, for over the things that you don't have, but you're always going to have more than you need. So you know, feel blessed and, and appreciate all the blessings that you have. And uh, if I would have if I would have done those two things, and I think that I would have just had a lot clearer head, you know what I mean? I don't know if it would have changed my career much because I did keep my head down and, and really kind of um, study the game. And, and I did try to, you know, keep perspective along the way, but I would have had a lot less stress. I would have had a lot more inner peace if I would have uh, taken those two things to heart. Really quickly, can you kind of tell our listeners how they could best connect with you and follow up with everything going on with Pure Sweat? Yeah, I mean, my, my stuff is simple. You know, Drew Hamlin is my name. And so H-A-N-L-E-N on all platforms, you know, and then Pure Sweat is just P-U-R-E-S-W-E-A-T. And then I've got a tech community that they can join that I send out free stuff, which is 314-461-1862. People always ask me, is it really you? Is it a robot? It's actually me. I actually reply to as many as I can. I get like 500 text messages a day. So obviously I can't get back to everybody every day, but um, I do my best to answer as many as I can, especially when I'm on planes and, and traveling, you know, around the country. I, I try to do my best job of getting back to people, but those are the best ways to connect with me. Well, that's so awesome. And I'll definitely have those all in the show notes below for our listeners to go and connect with you. And Coach Drew, thank you so much for coming on. I learned so much hearing from you. I can't wait to see a lot of the players that you've worked with develop over the course of the next season. And we'll definitely keep in touch.
Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you having me on and I look forward to uh, listening to all the future episodes as well. Thanks for listening to the Big Fellas Podcast. Check us out on all major social media platforms at Big Fellas Pod to join the chop up. You can also listen to us on every podcast platform on the planet. Stay tuned for the next episode, Big Fellas.